here today in Freud's consulting room and studio. This house is where Freud lived and worked. It has become a house where psychoanalysis has been preserved and also the place where the British psychoanalysis took the baton from the rest of the world when the Nazis closed the institutes all over Europe. And as Freud said, when he arrived to London, uh, now London has become the center of the world of psychoanalysis. He was determined, apparently, to remain in Vienna, but it was clear that, uh, actually, he, for being the founder of psychoanalysis and, and also for being Jewish, was in serious danger with the Nazis. So Dr. Jones, uh, the president of the British Psychoanalytic Society, went on a mission to Vienna to convince Freud to come to England. Anna Freud, his daughter, and his son, Ernest Freud, made an effort to try to preserve the atmosphere and the working and living environment that Freud had in Vienna. And in that sense, this house has captured Europe and Vienna, Austria of the 1930s. People say that in one of the sessions, one of his patients was trying to understand why he was so keen on the unconscious. And Freud used the Greek and Egyptian antiquities to explain him that if they are here, available to civilization, it was because they were once buried. And it was the act of burying them, uh, what preserved them. It's just by repressing uh, our childhood uh, experiences and fantasies that we become what we become. From the very beginning, in the 1910s, uh, the group was open to uh, receive uh, people from uh, many different uh, uh, cultural groups uh, and also from different uh, waves of immigration. And that created a special uh, mentality uh, in terms of openness to new ideas and the acceptance of uh, um, different kinds of people as well. We're a complicated organisation, like most organisations, and one of our strengths is our diversity and the fact that we've managed to contain, over the years, conflicting uh, ideologies and theories, especially from Anna Freud, Melanie Klein, Donald Winnicott, Bion. I think it arose initially, most dramatically, on soon after the death of Freud, and with the very common problem of who's the true inheritor. That kind of conflict may occur in families with material possessions, but it can also occur in, in, th in th systems of ideas with who's the true inheritor of the ideas of this you know, immensely charismatic and significant person who's died. They were very difficult times. They were very passionate times as well. And uh, it almost threatened to destroy the society. On this one occasion, evidently, there was um, an air raid and there were a lot of bombs dropping. And according to the story, Winnicott stood up and said, I don't know whether anybody has noticed, but there is an air raid going on at the moment and there are bombs are dropping all around us. And people just carried on because they were so intent on the controversial discussions, the debates about what was psychoanalysis and what wasn't psychoanalysis. Following a certain British uh, attitude to conflict, uh, they were able, the different factions were able to arrive to some kind of compromise that made the British society survive. And I think that in this case, conflict, instead of stopping creativity, has been a, f a driving force. The number of qualified analysts um, have been always very small in comparison to, say, the general population. But the influence that this small group have had is, is remarkable. As you can see, I am now next to Anna Freud's couch and chair. She made sure that the basic Freudian principles were applied in child education and child analysis. The last candidate of Ms. Freud for the British Society of Psychoanalysis personally 
revealed to me that as part of her technique, she would uh, knit uh, while the session took place. And when he qualified and the analysis finished, quite naturally, as a conclusion of the analysis, she gave the jumper to the student. That was a human, natural way of behaving. But I also think it conveys very well uh, her views on what psychoanalysis is about, which was about real experiences, real bonding, real contact, real uh, relating to a human being. Melanie Klein made a very important contribution to the field of child analysis. Basically, she discovered something that we call the psychoanalytic play technique. And this means that by the use of play, we can understand how the child feels, thinks, and how the child imagines and creates their own world, populated from the very beginning by unconscious fantasies and anxieties. The child's internal world can also colour the perceptions that he has from what comes from outside. And then the external world, or the world that appears to him, and that is coloured by these projections, is what we call projective identification. Wilfred Beale extended and expanded uh, Klein's ideas by placing an emphasis on how the child develops a capacity to think. Bion used the term containment to describe the mother's capacity to contain the child's the anxieties from the very beginning. The mother uses her own capacity to think to process the child's feelings even before the child himself or herself has got a capacity to discriminate what those feelings are about. Beale's theory of thinking is one that has been very inspiring and has been widely and is still widely used throughout the world. Winnicott was a paediatrician, first of all, and then he was a psychoanalyst. What Winnicott gives us is this focus on relationship. Winnicott said, there's no such thing as a baby. For me, this is uh, the core of Winnicott's work, that he never looks at the individual as just the individual and the internal world. He's always thinking about the parent-infant relationship that will be internalised, that has been internalised. There's the environment individual setup, which has been internalised. He observed that in life um, there are paradoxes. There's always an aspect of paradox in living. And actually, uh, psychoanalysis is about helping us understand how to tolerate that paradox. There's a real discernible theory there that is building on, on Freud and in this discourse with Melanie Klein so that you have a discernible paradigm shift, I think, in Winnicott's work. And I think it makes a huge contribution to psychoanalysis and the evolution of psychoanalysis. The clinical focus of the British Society, I think, is recognised worldwide. The therapeutic encounter takes place at many levels. Uh, the patient tells a story of their origins, of their, fam of their families, of their parents. The analyst is silent, paying suspended receptive attention, facing the patient's free associations. Now, in the current situation of the analysis, the patients pass conflictual knots or reactivated affects, sexual life, professional life, social relationships, all this making the indissoluble whole, like a piece of music in which the analysts may pick up the themes and variations 
and outline the contours of the Oedipus complex of childhood. Patients tend to repeat in an analysis patterns as well as anxieties and unconscious fantasies and ways of being that they experienced in their early lives. And they ex re-experience that in relation to the analyst. At the same time, the analyst also has his own feelings towards patients, but also the patients can evoke very kind of powerful feelings in the analyst. The understanding of the minute details of how this functions in a session, the vicissitudes of both transference and counter-transference, is a very important tool, not only in order to understand the world, the emotional world of the patient, but also a tool for helping the patient through their understanding to see when and how they repeat a certain pattern of behaviour. The British tradition in training very much values what we call full analysis um, in a way that I think is becoming increasingly unique to uh, the kind of training that we do here. That is, we see our patients five times a week. The intensity of the, pro of the five times a week analysis allow us to see certain kinds of patients that are not seen anywhere else in the world, really. Uh, the fact that we uh, can see borderline patients, we can see psychosomatic patients, uh, um, psychotic patients, and I think it is the intensity of the setting that allows for all these kinds of very severely disturbed patients to be seen because we keep co uh, very close contact with the reality of their internal world. There are other areas in which the, the intensity of five times a week becomes important. For instance, one is when one is working with dreams so that you can have access to a dream immediately after the night in which it was dreamt. The containment also of the negative transference seems to be also facilitated over consecutive sessions when difficult negative feelings have to be understood. We have people from social work, we have people from anthropology, from sociology, from philosophy, from literature, from psychology, of course from medicine, but all this again between you know those two factors, the openness to immigration and the openness to different disciplines um, created, I think, a very special flavor, I would say, to British psychoanalysis. People like Bion, Winnicott, Rosenfeld, Marion Milner, uh, very important figures in, in the history of our psychoanalysis here. Although they were involved in psychiatry, they were involved in mental hospitals, they participated in uh, national health services for the mentally ill. Nevertheless, they believed that they could approach patients without the need of medication or for medication. And I think that was very, very different to approaches in other countries. I would say that psychoanalysis today in the British society is perhaps characterized by a special quality of listening, and it goes in uh, two different directions. One is the obvious uh, need to listen in this specific psychoanalytic way uh, to the patient and to the patient's communication, whether it is uh, verbal communication or otherwise. But also it goes in another direction, and that is listening to the analyst's own mind and own, fi own feelings. Uh, which are terribly important.